what we're doing on Sunday nights is very simple and the outline of what I'm saying is on the white sheet which hopefully you've received when you came in. We're asking the question, what in the world is a Christian? And the way that we've chosen to answer it is that we're looking at various words which are used in the Bible to describe a Christian. And by looking at these various words, we're gradually building up the picture more and more clearly to find out what a Christian is. And we've not read anywhere in the New Testament that you're a Christian because you go to church. We've not read anywhere in God's Word that you're a Christian because you live in a Christian so-called country. I was told as a boy that a donkey born in a garage is still a donkey, not a car. Some people, you're not a Christian because you have friends who are Christians. You don't read that anywhere in the Bible. You're not a Christian because you believe the truths of the Christian faith. Don't read that in the Bible either. So we're looking at all different words and the word that we come to tonight is the word saint. One of the words which is used to describe a Christian in the Bible is the word saint. Every Christian in the world today is a saint which is a surprising truth to many people because generally speaking in life people use the word saint in quite a different way if you've been very ill and some kind neighbour has come and done the shopping and paid the rent and done all sorts of errands and cleaned the house and put the fires on done the cooking very often people would say she's a saint in other words, they mean she's somebody really special. That's the way the word saint is often used, but it's never used that way in the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church, and I haven't come to hit anybody tonight, uses the word saint in a very distinct way. It teaches that you can't become a saint in this life. You have to wait till after you're dead. It teaches that you only become a saint because the church elects you to be one. It teaches that only people who have a tremendous record of good works can be saints. And it teaches that in most cases, to be a saint you must have worked in your life or afterwards at least two miracles. But the Bible never uses the word saint like that at all might interest you to know that in 1974, I haven't got the latest statistics, there were 1,848 registered saints. Incidentally, St. George wasn't one of them. He's not on the list. St. Christopher, who some people trust in to keep them safe when they travel, he's not one of them. He's not on the list. None of these are recognised saints of the Roman Catholic Church. And what's most interesting of all, uh, St. Patrick isn't one of them either because he was never a member of the Roman Catholic Church. 626 of them were Italian. 576 came from France. And the bronze medal is won by the United Kingdom. <laughs> well, the British Isles anyway. 271. 1,000 of them were priests. 15 of them were popes. Fourteen of them were married women and eight of them were widowers. But the Bible never uses the word saint of anybody who's special. It uses the word saint of every Christian. Every Christian in the world today is a saint. Would you open your Bible at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10? Very helpful if you can turn to these verses, but if you're unable to do so, I'll read it to you anyway. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10 establishes what I'm teaching tonight. That every Christian in the world today is a saint. It tells us about the Lord Jesus that when he shall, talks about when he shall come, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Obviously the word glorified and the word admired are parallel words and the word saints 
therefore, is parallel with the expression all them that believe. All people who believe are saints and saints are composed of all them that believe. Now, turn back in your Bible to the letter, the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. And I've put quite a string of references on the sheet because the word saint or saints is found in every chapter of the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. In chapter 1, verse 13, well, it must be 3, mustn't it? I can't even find it in my own Bible. <laughs> well, we'll go to verse 15. I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, he writes to this Christian church. In verse 18, he reminds them of their inheritance, Christ's inheritance in the saints. In chapter 2, verse 19, he tells them that they are fellow citizens with the saints. In chapter 3, verse 8, he describes himself as less than the least of all saints. In chapter 3, 18 onwards, he prays that they may be able to comprehend or understand with all saints what are the dimensions of Christ's love. Chapter 4, verse 12, he says the reason that you have some gifts and other people have gifts is for the perfecting of the saints. And he goes on to say that that's the same as the body of Christ. Chapter 5, verse 3, tells us that certain behaviour is not becoming of saints. Chapter 6, verse 18, tells us to pray for all saints. And if you look carefully at every one of those references, you'll find indeed that the word saint refers to the ordinary Christian. The ordinary Christian believer is a saint. There was once a preacher called Dr. Harry Ironside and one day at his house called two nuns and he began talking to them and then they started talking about the saints. So he said to them, would you like to meet a saint? And they said yes and were excited. So he said, I'm a saint. I'm Saint Harry. <laughs> well, he was right, of course. We're very reluctant, aren't we, to use this title of ourselves. We don't mind describing ourselves as believers or Christians or sheep. We're very reluctant to say, I am a saint. It, it, sounds, a, it sounds a bit arrogant in our ears. But it shouldn't, you know. True Christians are saints. All of us who are believers are saints. That's why, incidentally, when I read the Bible, I never read the word saint. I never talk about the Gospel of Saint Matthew, ever. I hope you don't. Or the Gospel of Saint Mark, or Saint Luke, or Saint John. I never talk about Saint Paul, and because that keeps perpetuating the myth, doesn't it? That certain Christians are saints, and the rest of us aren't. I never talk about Saint John the Baptist, or Saint Mary, or anybody else like that. Let's just use their names. You have to remember that the authorised version which we read from is an Anglican Bible and one of the teachings of the Church of England is of course that certain Christians are saints and certain Christians aren't. But that's not the teaching of the Word of God. Now the fact that all of us who are true Christians are saints helps us to understand what a true Christian is. So that's the first main subdivision on our sheet this evening. Now, if we were reading Greek, everywhere we come across the word saint or saints in the Bible, we would read the word hagios. I'm sorry to give you a Greek lesson, but it will help us, I think. The Greek word hagios, which is translated in English saint, in fact means holy one. Holy one. And we find the word saint or saints 60 times in the New Testament. 60 times the average Christian is described as hagios, saint, holy one, someone who's holy. 
Now the same word in its Hebrew equivalent is found 800 times in the Old Testament. And when we see how the word hagios and its Old Testament equivalent are used, we will understand what it means to be a holy one, what it means to be a saint. Now you'll remember that in the Old Testament, the high priest Aaron had special clothes. Those clothes were described as holy garments. Hagios, holy. Now those garments weren't described as holy because they were cleaner than everybody else's. Perhaps they were cleaner than everybody else's and they were certainly clean. But they weren't called holy because they were the cleanest clothes of all. They were called holy because they were different. The high priest had to wear certain clothes as a sign of his office. He had to wear certain clothes to show that he was the chosen one who was set apart in a special way for the priestly service of God. The clothes were called holy because they were different, because they were set apart for God. Holy, hagios, saint, means different, because set apart for God. Now in the tabernacle, which was the Old Testament place of worship for many, many years, which is, there was a particular part of the tabernacle called the holy place. Now, it was called the holy place not because it was cleaner than the rest of the tabernacle. In fact, if you think it logically, it was probably dustier than everybody uh, everywhere else in the tabernacle because the priest only went into the holy place once a year and it was never cleaned. So why was that part of the tabernacle called the holy place? Because it was a symbol that God is unapproachable except by the way that he appoints. The high priest went in there just once a year. That place was different from the rest of the tabernacle. It was set apart for God in a way that the rest of the tabernacle wasn't. Holy means different because set apart for God. Now you'll remember right at the beginning of the Bible, God takes a day of the week and hallows it, makes it holy, and it's called the Sabbath day. That day was to be kept different from the other six days. On the other six days, you must do all your work. The Sabbath day, stop, because the Sabbath day is different. Why is it different? Because it's set apart for God. You're to spend the whole day thinking about God, speaking about God, worshipping God and serving God. Now I've used those illustrations just to teach one lesson. The word holy, the word hagios, the word saint means different. Why? Different because set apart for God. A Christian is called a saint, a holy one, Hagios, because he is a man, a woman, a young person who is different because set apart for God. Now why must someone who is set apart for God be different? Because God himself is different. The Father is different. He's called Holy Father. The Son is different. He's called Thy Holy Child. The Holy Spirit is different. He's constantly called the Holy Spirit. God is so different that even the angels which surround him say, Holy, Holy, Holy. And if someone's set apart for God, the God who is different, if someone's set apart for God, that person himself is different. That's why Christians are called saints. They're different because they've been set apart for God. Now, friends, how does God set apart people for himself? Well, the answer to that was in our reading 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let me summarize as simply as I can what Paul was saying there. What Paul was saying is this. People hear the gospel. They hear with these ears the message of a crucified Christ. They hear with these ears a message of forgiveness of sins which comes through a crucified Saviour. They hear with these ears that God himself went to a cross of shame, later rose from the dead, the man Christ Jesus, and that all wrapped up with that event is the forgiveness of sins. That's the message that they hear. All over the world tonight people are hearing that message. Now, as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, some people, when they hear that message, think that it's stark, raving bonkers. In his day, they were mostly Greeks who were highly educated and loved philosophy. Some people, when they hear that message, they think it's absolutely stupid, foolishness. There are other people who, they want all sorts of proofs and logic to other people who want miracles. But Paul says, we don't give in, we don't capitulate. All we do is we go into all the world preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We tell people who Jesus is. We tell people what he has done. We tell them about the cross. We preach redemption. We preach the forgiveness of sins. We preach the good old-fashioned, unchanged gospel. And... While some people hear that message with their outward ears, some people hear it in here. And what goes as a call to everybody who listens goes right into the hearts of some people as a personal call. The whole congregation hears it. They hear God calling them to repentance and faith. God calling them to believe. God calling them to Christ but some of the people hear that call right in here and they obey. Not many noble people hear that call, says Paul, not many special people. Not many influential people hear that call. It's mostly weak people and despised people and people who the world has largely written off and people who don't count very much. It's largely just plain ordinary people who hear that call. But some people hear two calls the outward call with their ears and the inward call with their hearts. And when they hear the inward call, they believe that they're hearing the truth. And when they believe that they're hearing the truth, they rest upon that truth and commit themselves to that truth. They don't just have a set of beliefs in their head about Christ, but they actually go to Christ who died for sinners and they cast themselves upon Christ, and they lay hold of Christ, and they come to Christ, and they approach Christ, and they trust Christ, and they throw themselves upon Christ. And because they have a call, they come into union with Christ. That is how some people become different and set apart for God by gospel preaching. And that is why I say the word saint tells us what a true Christian is. And therefore I have a plain question. Have you heard the gospel? Have you believed the gospel in your heart? Have you mo been moved by what you believe to cast yourself upon Jesus Christ? Not fully understanding everything may be but casting yourself upon him as the only hope for those who otherwise would be everlastingly lost. If you have cast yourself upon Christ, you are already different. Because the average man and woman in the street is quite happy to use Christ's name merely as a swear word, or at very best to ignore the real teaching of the scriptures altogether. You are already different if you believe the message and have cast yourself upon the Saviour. And having come into union, been joined to God's Son, you are joined to God. You're different and set apart for God. And therefore you already merit the title, Saint. 
Now the second half of what I have to say tonight is the next division on the sheet. The word saint tells you what a true Christian is and the word saint also tells you how a true Christian behaves. Every Christian in the world today is a saint. Every Christian. You've been set apart for God. But who is God? And what does God expect of us? In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 you have three words who tell you what you need to know about God and three words telling you what God expects of you. I am holy, says God. Be ye holy, says God. Now if you've been set apart for God, who says, I am holy, the way that you will live will be in obedience to the other words, be ye holy. If you've been set apart for God, you have to be different because you are different. You're set apart for the one who is holy. Often, again and again and again and again, people say, if I become a Christian, must I be different? And again and again, a lying church says to them, well, you don't need to be all that different. And all the time the Bible says, if you come to God at all, you come to one who is so different that if you're joined to him and come to him, yes, you must be different. There is no such thing as a Christian who is not different from non-Christians. Let's go in our Bibles to Ephesians 5 because that tells us some of the ways in which a Christian is different. I'm set apart for God. God is holy. That means at once that certain things have to be cut out. Listen. Ephesians 5 verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. If you're set apart for a holy God, you can't have unholy words. You can't have unholy actions. You can't have unholy thoughts. They've got to be cut out. That's what John's getting at in 1 John 5.18 where he says this, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. <laughs> now, of course, you often meet Christians who claim that they don't sin. Have you ever met them? I have. Christians who tell us that they don't sin anymore. Or sometimes they water it down a bit and say, well, I haven't consciously sinned for so many years. And there's only one answer to such Christians, and that is to say, well, if you don't sin, my friend, it means that you've stopped saying the Lord's Prayer, where we say, forgive us. Don't we? If you say you're, you've never sinned, then you must have stopped praying after the manner that Jesus instructed, because he said that we were, every time we pray, we to ask God to forgive us. Now, what John's saying here is that sin is not the done thing in a believer's life. He's saying, if, you care, if we had another Greek lesson, we would find out that John is saying here that the direction and the general trend and the tenor of the Christian life is a life walking further and further away from sin. It's not the done thing in his life. He's cutting more and more sin out. He's different from what he used to be. He's set apart for God. He can't help being different and he tries to be more and more different from the world and more and more like his God as the days and years go by. But 
don't think that the Christian life is all cutting things out. I read this week of a, of a Christian preacher, whether he was a true Christian seems unlikely, but whatever he went to preach, he preached on the thou shalt nots of the Bible. And there are plenty of thou shalt nots, so there is a negative side to the Christian life. There are things that we must cut out. His text was always, thou shalt not steal, or thou shalt not bear false witness, or thou shalt not commit adultery, or thou shalt not kill, or something similar. And one day he preached in a little country chapel in the morning, and went home to lunch at the farmhouse of a, one of the members of the congregation. And after lunch the farmer said, he said, well I'd like you to come and meet my donkey. So the preacher said, all right, but, but why, do you, why do you want me to meet your donkey? He says, well, my donkey's a Christian. He says, I don't understand. He says, well, you told us this morning, thou shalt not smoke, thou shalt not drink, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, and these are all the marks of a Christian. He says, well, I've been thinking about my donkey. And, <laughs> well, you've got the point. There's more of a Christian life than cutting certain things out. Because the, a Christian is set apart for God, he doesn't just cut out those things which displeases God, he makes a positive effort to do those things which do please God. That's why the Apostle says God has not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. That's why the Apostle says without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. He's not just concerned to say no to certain things, he's very concerned to find out those things which do please God and to make those his priorities. Now that, therefore, the word saint tells us how a Christian behaves. Well, let's turn over the sheet to... We haven't done that for a few weeks. Because there's an interesting thing about the word saint which I should point out to you. The word saints is found 59 times in the New Testament. The word saint is found once. In other words, this word is always found in the plural, saints. Only in Philippians 4 and verse 21 is it found in the singular, and then it greets every saint. So even then it's a plural word, even though it's put in the singular form. Now that teaches us something at once about true saints. That's why you can never call anybody saint this or saint that or saint the other because the Bible never uses the word saint actually quite in that way. It always uses the word saint in the plural. You never find a saint in isolation. Do you remember those men in the 4th century who went out into the desert of North Africa and built great pillars the first one built his pillar about 20 feet high and then he lived on the top of it. So he wouldn't have contact with anybody because he felt he would be more saintly if he didn't have contact with anybody. Isn't it true that most of the falls in your Christian life come through your contact with other people and the difficulties sometimes of living with them or getting on with them? Well, he thought, I'll spare myself the trouble of, of getting on with people. I'll go and live on my own at the top of a pillar. Well, of course, it became quite a craze and of course it wasn't long before the pillars were hundreds of feet high and the people were living on little platforms and letting down their baskets to receive their food from the faithful and they thought they could cut themselves off from the world, they would be more saintly. And the same thing happened in Britain. On your holidays, you'll go along stretches of the coast and there'll be a little chapel where some hermit lived for years and years. And on all the islands around the British coast almost, there are little churches and little places where people went to live very often on their own so they had as little contact with other people as possible and they thought that way they would be more saintly. It's all a myth, you know. True saints are never found in isolation unless, of course, they don't happen to know another Christian. True saints are always found in the plural because God never intended that you should go it alone in the Christian life. Not even the apostles were allowed to go it alone. When they went out to preach, they had to go two by two. God never intended that any Christian should go it alone. 
He intended that every Christian should be baptised and join a church and experience the warmth and strength which comes from church life. Now saints are always, when, when there is a church, found in fellowship with a church. And they are, you know. You examine your New Testament. They are always conscious that they are not the only ones who have been set apart for God. They're conscious that the other fellow Christians are very different from them, but nonetheless they are fellow saints. Very conscious of that. They can't think of the possibility of just living the Christian life in isolation. In the last century, the impression was given that if you prayed and read the Bible every day, it didn't really matter whether you had any contact with other Christians, you'd probably do very well in the Christian life. That's not what the New Testament says anywhere. You certainly won't do very well in the Christian life if you cut yourself off from other people. <laughs> Says somebody that the other Christians are so hard to get on with. Now, after all, there's that office there and he hasn't got the good sense to see that all my suggested solutions for the church are, are just are the answer to, to all our problems. And there's, that, there's that teenager who prays in the prayer meeting as if God and him were, were close pals. And there's that elderly lady who's sort of gushing with glory and there's all these other people who are they're so hard to get on with in the, in the Christian life. So what? The word saints is always found in the plural. And we accept that there are eccentricities and different backgrounds and education, different races and cultures, but we are fellow saints together. And we look at every Christian and we say to every Christian, I am yours because I am his. So this one word saint tells us a great deal. But let me remind you of this. The old Negro spiritual unfortunately sung at football stadiums today when the saints go marching in is based on biblical truth. There is a day when the saints will go marching in. Scripture says so. There is a day when the Son of God will swing open the portals of heaven and all those who were redeemed by coming to him in faith will go through together as a great army of people, and so many of them that no man will be able to number them. A great day when the saints will go marching in. But Scripture says there are two categories of people in the world. There are saints Every Christian in the world today is a saint. And there are sinners. The saints still sin, but they are saints nonetheless. People who are different because set apart for God. But the destination of sinners is altogether different. And the Bible describes it like this. Outer darkness. The smoke of torment going up forever and ever. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Are you a sinner still? Or are you a saint?